We've been in the book of James for the last couple of weeks, and I think obviously because of where we are and what's happening in the world around us, I want to deviate from that for a little bit and just bring a word to you. Um, when, when Robert and I were first married, uh, we had gone down to Medora. I remember traveling down there. It was the summertime. Uh, right after we got married, she was driving her 77 Chevelle Malibu, green with a white top. It was awesome. And we're coming back from Medora. It's late, late, late at night. In fact, it's probably the wee hours of the morning. And we're traveling through Theodore Roosevelt National Park, pitch black outside. And she's driving. We've uh, talked through the day. We're both kind of tired. The AM radio is on. And I think there's some station fading in and out over the speakers. And it caught my attention as I looked out the window, all of the stars that were up in the sky. It was amazing because it was so dark. And you could see all of these stars, and I was just mesmerized with the whole thing. And I'm staring out my side window at all of these stars up there. And as I'm looking at this absolutely fascinated, I, I suddenly hear the, 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 like gravel beneath the wheels. And I could tell that we're going off to the side of the road. And I looked over at Robin and said, are you okay? She said, you're distracting me. And I was not distracting her. I was just looking out the window. But she wanted to look at whatever it was that I was looking at. That being said, we usually go in the direction of our focus, and whatever we're looking at tends to get our direction. So just considering where we're at in the world today and what's going on, we can focus on all of the negativity, and I would just tell you, there's going to be times you just need to close up your Facebook, your live, your news feed, and just what's going on there, and open up the Word of God instead and just begin to read, because what, what gets our focus gets our attention. And you can either focus on what's wrong in the world or you can focus on what's right with God. And I just kind of want to challenge you with this thought. Just because there's a storm or a tempest in the world and in the culture and everything going on around you right now, it doesn't need to be a storm on the inside of you. Just because there's a storm around you doesn't need to, mean, doesn't need to be a storm on the inside of you. By now, you're asking a lot of questions, and some of them you verbalized, some of them you haven't verbalized. Maybe you're asking yourself, why, and when is this going to end, and what does this mean to us, and what is God trying to tell us? I just want to encourage you with this, that everything that happens in our life, guys, everything that's going on in our life right now has been handled by God. It's gone through the hands of God. None of this has surprised Him at all. And in fact, maybe what's going on in our world today is drawing some attention from you and from me and from the world around us. And if, as a result of what we are facing, God starts to get some attention. Maybe people are bending a knee. Maybe they're praying a little bit more. Maybe they're opening their Bibles a little bit more often. Wouldn't that be good for God to just allow some things to come into our world sometimes that shake us a little bit just to get His attention in our lives? And I just want you to know that the more we get to know Him, the less acquainted we will become with fear. And maybe sometimes the storms in our life, they come just for that reason. And there's storms obviously going on in your life right now with the whole COVID, the coronavirus thing. Uh, I realize our jobs, our income, uh, the safety of our families, there's just a ton of things going on for us right now. And in all of that, I just want you to know there's a God that wants you to get to know Him a little better so you can trust Him. Um, my mom got married when I was six years old, just about seven, and uh, instantly I had three stepsisters, a stepbrother, and a stepdad. And uh, for those first seven years of my life, it had just only been my mom and I, and uh, when, when, when we moved into this house with, with the man that would become my dad, my brother and I was just a little tiny house. We had to share a bedroom. In fact, I was in the first grade. He was in the third grade. Not only did we share a bedroom, we shared a bed. It was just a little rollaway cot. And you know what happens when you put a first grader and a third grader together, and they're supposed to be going to bed. We would get the giggles sometimes and do a whole bunch of talking. And I can remember on more than one occasion just kind of hanging out with my brother, and we're talking and giggling when we should be going to sleep. And I could hear my dad, my stepdad at the time. I didn't really know him, but his footsteps started to come down the wooden steps into our cement basement. And I can remember flipping over in bed, pretending I'm just you know, sleep and doing that whole thing. And my stepbrother telling me, you don't have to be worried. You don't have to be scared. It's okay. He's not mad. But I didn't know that because I didn't know him like my stepbrother knew him. And in fact, that was the case when he would come down there and just say, I think you guys need some sleep. And he wasn't mad at all, but I didn't know him. And so I didn't know how to respond to him. 
And I'm just telling you that sometimes the things that go on in our life happen so that we can get to know God a little bit better. God wants us to know his personality, that he's trustworthy, that he's present, that he's fully engaged with you. Um, I'm going to share with you just one of my favorite stories from one of the Gospels today. It's going to be in Mark chapter 4, and we're going to put the scriptures up on the screen for you as we go through all of this thing. I love this story because um, I think I can put myself in this story. It's an easy story to relate to. It's not a parable where we have to kind of dig into it to try to find the meaning in it, but it's really a story that I I think all of us can relate to. Um, This is early on in the disciples' walk with Jesus. They had seen him do some miracles. They saw him cast out demons. They saw him heal some people, but they really didn't know who Jesus was yet. But they're going to get to know him a little bit better through this little story that I'm going to share with you. Um, Jesus in Mark chapter 3 has been doing ministry. He's been out healing people. The disciples have been hanging out with him. And then at the end of the day, Jesus wants to take a little journey with them. And in Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse number 35, uh, the story begins like this. It was evening time. And Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. Jesus initiates this journey. Now, I don't know about you, but North Dakota with all the lakes, all the waters that we have here, I've been out with several people, and you know, when it's a beautiful summer's evening, and you can get alone with some friends and some family in a boat and just be out on that glassy water, and the sun is getting low in the sky as it was for Jesus and the disciples, they're going to be on the Sea of Galilee. It's maybe four miles wide and about 13 miles long, something like that, not a huge body of water. And I would imagine by this time of the day, it's just a calm time. And uh, it could be a beautiful little journey across the lake with Jesus. And he initiates this journey. And I can just see this now. It's quiet. The disciples are probably a little bit tired um, getting into the boat. And they all find their place. They grab an oar and they begin to row. And pulling the oars as they begin to row this boat through the waters of the Sea of Galilee. And I think off to the west, the sun begins to set. And the the story continues in verse 36, that they took Jesus in the boat, and they started out, and they left the crowds behind. And then, this is really kind of key, don't don't miss this, because in parentheses, Mark puts this in there, although he says there were other boats following them as well. We'll talk about those other people a little bit later in the story. Now, it seems like a great story at this point in time. They're out on the calmness of the water. I mean, this is a normal, everyday life. Most of these guys in the boat with Jesus, they're fishermen. They were very familiar with this part of the journey. They knew what it was like to be in the water. Their whole lives surrounded the Sea of Galilee. They were familiar with this. But then as we read on in verse number 37, there's this little three-letter word that changes the emphasis and the feeling of the whole story. Just kind of like things going on in your life. Everything was going along just fine, but, and that's the word that is used here, but. Verse number 37, but soon, without warning, suddenly soon, this fierce storm came up. They tell us that because of the lay of the land, there's really steep hills on one side of the lake and just kind of level ground on the other side. And I don't know, it's about the cooling of the day and when the cooling of the air and all the turbulence that goes on, that storms can come up really soon. And that's exactly what goes on here. It was just an amazing journey. It was a peaceful journey. It was a calm journey until the storms came up. And it says in the rest of verse 37 that high waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Now, here's kind of the general rule when I'm in a boat. I don't know how it is with you, but here's my rule when I'm in a boat. Here's the rule. Dry inside, wet outside. Dry inside, wet outside. And yet the waves begin to break over the bow of the boat, over the sides of the boat, and it begins to fill with water. And I would imagine that there is a sense of panic now as the disciples begin to bail water. And they're wanting to keep this boat afloat. They want to be safe. And I just wonder sometimes for us, maybe just where we're at in life today. Mom and Dad, I bet it feels a little bit like the boat might be sinking. Um... The bills are still going to come, but your hours have been cut. The price of oil has been cut, but the bills are still going to come. And what do we do with our children? And there's no daycares. And 
I can't find what I need in the grocery store. And what is this going to look like on Monday? And what's going to happen next Monday? How long is this going to go on? And doesn't it seem like right now with what we're facing in the world that it can all just be very daunting and overwhelming, like being in a boat in the middle of a lake and the water's coming over the side of the boat and it seems like drowning would be imminent. And it can feel that way for us. And then Mark puts this amazing little detail for us in here. And this is the part of the story that could kind of bother us a little bit, but it's key to the story. Look at verse 38. Jesus, while the storm is going on and water is filling the boat, he's at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Mark puts this detail in there. Jesus' head is on a cushion. We are freaking out. We're trying to bail out. We are panicked. We are afraid. We are scared to death. And Jesus has the audacity to have his head on a pillow, on a cushion, to find a place of comfort. And he's sleeping while we are drowning. Ever felt that way before? You ever felt like you're just in the middle of the storm? You're going under. You're going down. And you've cried out to Jesus, you've prayed, you've searched him out. Oh God, where are you? And it's so silent into the, into the prayer, just like Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat. Jesus, I don't need you in the back of the boat. I need you in the front of the boat. I need you to get this water out. I need you to take charge. And while you're going through the divorce, you're going through the betrayal, you're going through the financial difficulties, you're going through the, the thoughts of suicide and addiction and, and coronavirus, doesn't it seem like Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat? You know what's amazing about the Sea of Galilee? That in the day, in the day, in the normal sea of life, when the sun is shining, the waters are blue and they're beautiful. But at night, when the sun sets and you're alone in the boat, the waters seem black and bottomless and ominous and endless. And I would imagine that for some of us it can feel like that a little bit right now. And they want to know why Jesus is back in the boat sleeping. Because you know what? If Jesus was awake right now, if Jesus was awake in our world, why wouldn't he do something about what's going on around us? But, but since he lets this keep going, since this whole epidemic is still going on, doesn't it seem like, doesn't it look like, couldn't it feel like Jesus is sleeping on a cushion in the back of the boat? The disciples must have thought the same thing. They didn't know what Jesus was capable of doing. So they wake him up in verse number 38. It goes on. The disciples, they woke him up and they shouted at him, Teacher, don't you care? We're going to drown. The question was huge. Don't you care? And as I pondered that a little bit, I'm putting myself in the boat. I'm putting myself with Jesus. I'm trying to figure out who Jesus is just in what I know of him today and walking with him for all these years. And it wasn't that Jesus didn't care. It's just that Jesus knew they weren't going to drown. It wasn't that he, he, he didn't care that they were going to drown. It's just that he knew that they were ultimately going to be okay. In every story I believe that we read in the life of Jesus, these are recorded for us in God's Word so that we can apply the principles and the story to where we are in our, in our life today. There's a reason for the story. And I would guess that this story is in there to tell us that it's not that Jesus doesn't care. It's in here to tell us that Jesus knows and He wants us to know we're going to be okay. And it's not that He doesn't care. He just knows that we're going to come through this. It's in our human nature to want to avoid every storm. We pray that way. We pray, God, protect my children. God, protect my money. God, protect my home. God, protect. And we buy insurance to protect because we want to navigate through life as painless and easy as we possibly can. And that's just the way we're made. If I was going to go across the Sea of Galilee in a boat, I would want to get across the Sea of Galilee in a boat with no waves coming inside the boat. But the storms come, and Jesus knows that storms are inevitable. They're sudden, they're fierce, they're dark, and they're terrifying. And you know, in the midst of that, you can either become intimate with the storm, or you can be intimate with the storm chaser. There's people, uh, we'll see them 
on TV soon as the weather changes in the spring. Thunderstorms roll across the prairies and the tornadoes, and there's people that have all of these mocked up vehicles, and they will chase these storms. They know more about a tornado than you and I will ever know. And there's maybe some value in knowing the storm, but I want to tell you, instead of knowing the storm, I want to know the storm chaser. I want to know the one who can chase away the storms in our life. And that's Jesus. Verse number 39 in the story says, Jesus did wake up. And when he wakes up, he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, silence, be still. And suddenly, Mark says, suddenly, he was amazed by the suddenly, the wind stopped. And I love this, there was great calm. There might not be calm outside of the doors of your apartment, your trailer, your car, your house, but there can be great calm on the inside of all of that. And Jesus simply spoke, and when he spoke, the waves and the winds calmed. And it wasn't just calm, it was great calm. You want to know this question, you want this answered, don't you? Jesus, don't you care about the storms that we're facing? As parents, as students, um, Lord, our, our, our life has been turned absolutely upside down. Don't you care? And he calmed that storm, and he calms the storms, and he'll calm your storm. And it's not that Jesus might address the storm outside of your home, but Jesus can address the storm on the inside of your heart. And I think Jesus really kind of nails us down because they had a, a question for him. The disciples said, don't you care? That was their question to him. So he calms the storm first. First he addresses the crisis, but then he asks them a question. Look what he asks them in verse number 40. Why are you afraid? In fact, there's a question that follows. He says, do you still have so little faith? In other words, I don't know, you should have walked with me long enough by now to know that not only can I open blind eyes, not only can I heal the deaf, not only can I deliver the possessed, I can also calm storms. I mean, this is effortless for me. He's really asking them, guys, don't you know who I am? I just wonder if there's some that you might be watching today, and I don't know where you are in, in a faith journey. Um, some of you attend here regularly at Life Church. Some of you are watching from somewhere else. Uh, you come from some different background, and you've known Jesus by name. Uh, you grew up in a background. You grew up maybe associated with a church. Your parents went to church, and you've known that there is a Jesus. But you've really never gotten to know who Jesus is. You know that he's here. You know he's a historical figure. You know he was a prophet, an itinerant preacher, whatever description you might want to use, but do you really know who Jesus is? And it's opportunities like this. We, we say, Jesus, I need to know who you are. Jesus would ask us really the question, don't you, don't you really know that I care? I'll take care of the world on the outside, but maybe the most important storm right now is the uh, storm on the world on the inside of you. And Jesus, I think, wants to show us that he can calm the storms. But here's really the key. And this is what I love about this story. They had Jesus in the boat. So I, I would just pause with this question. You're in the middle of a storm right now. You're going through stuff with everything that's going on in the world around you. Do you have Jesus in your boat? Do you have an intimate, personal relationship with this Jesus? First, you've got to have Jesus in your boat if you want to navigate the storm. And you remember, this is amazing to me. Mark puts this little, little detail in there that while the disciples are crossing the Sea of Galilee, there were other boats following alongside of them. And you know what? We don't even concentrate or think about this very much. But because of the fact that they had Jesus in their boat and they cried out to that Jesus, he calmed the storm, not just for the twelve but for all the people that were along with them on that journey in the lake that night. And I think this, I think that if we can have peace and calm in the storms of our life, 
I think if Jesus can speak calmness and a great calm on the inside of us, I think it can have a profound impact on your children, on your friends, and on your family because you're anchored, you're focused, you're focusing on what's right with Jesus and not what's wrong in the world. The story kind of ends up in chapter, uh, excuse me, verse number 41. The disciples, they were absolutely terrified. I mean, okay, the guy can heal guys, he can heal people, he can deliver demonic powers, but like speaking to the weather, this is huge. They were terrified and they, they asked themselves this question, who is this guy? Even the winds and the waves obey him. And I think it's okay for us to draw back sometimes and say, well, Jesus who exactly are you? And I love the fact that we can use the Word of God, I think, even to answer that question. God knows we'd all ask that question, and He'll even use His creation to help us understand who He is a little bit. I love the passage found from an Old Testament prophet. His name was Isaiah, and God speaks to him, and He's trying to get people to understand how big He really is. That God is so much bigger than all this stuff around us. And in Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 26, God challenges us with the very thing that I did at the beginning of my message today as I talked about Robin and me traveling through the park and looking out at the stars. God says this in uh, chapter 40, verse 26. He says, uh, look up into the heavens. And he imagines at that point in time, we're looking up there and we see all of these stars. And he asks this question, who created all these stars? Well, I can answer that for you. It wasn't the Chinese. It wasn't a factory in Detroit. It was God himself that created all these stars. And then it goes on to say in the rest of that verse, he brings them out like an army, one after the other. And then I love this, calling them each by name. I did a little research here that in our little galaxy, we can see part of our galaxy when we see the Milky Way. And I remember the first time as a kid discovering the Milky Way out on the prairies of North Dakota, looking up into this expanse that went from north to south, this amazing gathering of stars up above my head. It was phenomenal as I saw this whole thing. They tell us that in our little galaxy right here, there's about 250 billion stars. Plus or minus 150 billion stars. The Hubble Space Telescope is up in the sky and it's looking at all of the galaxies. They say there's at least 100 billion galaxies just like our own. There are billions, trillions of these stars. There are far more stars than there are people on this planet. And God says this, I want you to remember, I want you to remember something. I remember all these stars, I remember all these people. And he says in the last part of this verse, he says because of his great power, God's great power, because of his incomparable strength, not a single one of them is missing. In fact, he says in another spot, I call them out each by name. I'm telling you, would you just listen to me? Tomorrow when you wake up, the sun is going to rise just like it's always risen. The moon is going to be seated in its course above our planet exactly where it needs to be. It's the same sun that shone on Jesus when he initiated the journey with his disciples. It's the same moon that illuminated his face when he cried out to God in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the same stars that shine down in the night sky over our head that shone down over the face of Jesus while he was in the garden that night. Today, all of the oceans around this planet are still in their boundaries. All of the borders of the lands are established exactly where God wants them to be. And I'm telling you, all the storms that surround you, surround your home, surround your heart, surround your mind, surround your family, all of those storms can be calmed inside of your heart if Jesus is in your boat.